restrictions uh, of things that he felt or the site felt um, hurt people like child pornography, assassination, stolen goods, etc. But like many libertarians, he felt like drugs were a personal choice and that those were not limited. And um, but it wasn't designed as a drug site specifically. It was designed to give people the experience of an open market without government involvement. It ran on um, the Tor network, which is anonymous, and um, used Bitcoin and cryptocurrency as the currency exchange. So uh, it was outside of uh, any government uh, control. And um, for this, he, they gave him double life, which is a worse sentence than most murderers, rapists, child pornographers, and kidnappers get. It's a harsher sentence than a real drug kingpin, Pablo Escobar, got. Uh, he got 60 years, and he allegedly was responsible for 3,000 homicides and 300 assassinations. So um, this is being appealed. Why is that? Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know why that's not, it's up there, but it's not here. Can we stop that for a sec? Uh, sure. I don't understand. We are appealing this case. Um, the appeal was uh, filed <coughs> in January. It is two and a half times the length of an average appeal. Um, there's so much in it, and the lawyers said they could have put a ton more. Violations pre-trial, trial, and sentencing, of course, which is so far out of the norm for a nonviolent offense. Um, and this appeal defends not only Ross, but all of our due process rights. Because if we don't have fair trials in this country, we are not a free country. And every unfair trial that goes by that's not challenged uh, brings us one step closer to tyranny, in my opinion. Um, now, there's a whole lot in the appeal, as I said. One of the main points was the suppression of evidence that was exculpatory, was favorable to Ross, that was not allowed to be heard by the jury. It involved these two federal agents who were at the core of the Maryland Silk Road investigation. They were working on it for a couple of years, and it, they had pleaded guilty to uh, stealing over a million dollars from the site and people on the site. And um, the jury was not allowed to know about this. But the really important thing, I think, is that they were computer forensic experts who had free run of this site and everything on it for a long time and could um, change things. They had what's been called the keys to the kingdom. This is some of the things they had the ability to do. They could change um, passwords, PIN numbers. They could commandeer accounts and act as DPR, who is the Dread Pirate Roberts, the main person Ross is being accused of excuse me, being. Um, they could uh, manipulate and create logs, chats, private messages, private keys, bank accounts. They basically had the keys to the kingdom. They could do anything they wanted. And they could change things on there. And this was the evidence that the jury was seeing, was the evidence that had been tainted by these uh, agents. And of course, it's scandalous. Um, but what's really appalling and very dangerous is that the jury didn't know about these guys. They didn't have any idea that this all was going on. The uh, prosecution said, well, if, if it becomes public, it'll impede our investigation. The defense said, OK, we'll wait. We'll wait for, until you finish your investigation in a couple of months. And they said, no, the court agreed. And the court agreed to suppress this information. And um, the really bad thing about that is that it turned out they, that the agents, it wouldn't have jeopardized it at all. They already knew about it they were being investigated. They had been uh, interviewed by law enforcement several months before. We even today don't know the extent of the corruption. We don't know if there's other agents involved. We, there's sealed evidence. There are numerous, numerous uh, encrypted emails that the, those agents had that when the government offered them a plea deal, in decrypting those messages was not part of it. And so um, we don't know what was in there. And, you know, like, why? Why wouldn't you want to know? Um, what are you hiding? And we'll never know if that jury had known about these agents, if, and if they had free run the site, uh, and had all that ability to change things, if it would have cast reasonable doubt on Ross's guilt. Obviously, the prosecution thought it would. 
because they fought tooth and nail to stop it. But this is in direct violation of the Brady Bill, Brady Rule, which is well-established law that prosecutors are not allowed to suppress evidence favorable to a defendant. It's an epidemic in this country that prosecutors are doing this. They, um, Judge uh, Alice Kaczynski of the Ninth Circuit has written and spoken extensively about this because it's so out of control. It's a direct violation of the law that this happened. So suppression of evidence was one uh, thing. Another thing was um, blocked cross-examination. And you have a right to defend yourself with cross-examination in a trial. It involved this agent, another federal agent, Jared Yagen. He worked for two years on the Silk Road site as um, undercover, uh, thousands of hours, and um, actually helped run the site. <laughs> And um, he believed, he testified in trial, that he believed there were many DPRs, many heads of this site. But he had been focusing in on one of them, named Mark Carpellis. And this all came out in cross-examination by the defense. But it was all from the government's own evidence and their own agent. Um, so he had this substantial case against Mark Carpellis, who was a computer systems developer who operated multiple websites. He twice documented in sworn affidavits that he had probable cause to believe Carpellis was DPR, and he sought a warrant for his uh, email account. But he was, his investigation and in closing it on Carpellis, he said, was sabotaged by DHS Maryland, the same site as the corrupt agents where they were working. And, um, and this agency in Baltimore alerted Carpellis that law enforcement was after him by seizing over $2 million from his account. That'll get your attention. And a little while later, this agent testified that Carpellis' lawyers called a meeting with Baltimore, with DHS Baltimore, and said, look, we've got a deal for you. We'll give you a name. We'll give you DPR's name if you'll back off our client. And we don't know what else happened in that meeting. We don't know what was exchanged. We now know that there was corruption in that agency. And two weeks later, Ross was arrested, Mark Carpellis, for two and a half years, was never charged with anything. He's recently been arrested in Japan for embezzlement, something unrelated. At this point in the trial, um, the prosecutor leaps up. Sarah Turner leaps up, and he's like, objection, objection. You stop this cross-examination. This cannot go on. He was very vehement about it. Um, and the judge was like, why? What? What? This is legitimate. This is fine. We should be able to go ahead with this. We're finding things out here, you know, and he just objected and objected to the point. She didn't call a sidebar, which is what a judge would usually do to speak to lawyers if it's not in front of the jury. But she just said, look, I'm just going to send the jury home an hour early. Our lawyer had at least another hour of questioning to go. And she said she was doing this in the interest of justice. Our lawyer said, look, this is Brady Rule again, the Brady Rule I've referenced before. He can't stop this cross-examination. This is evidence that is favorable to Ross. And the judge agreed. And she also said, and these are quotes from the transcript, direct quotes. She went on to say, if the agent pursued someone other than the defendant, not only was it highly relevant, it was directly relevant. How he arrived at that conclusion was obviously relevant. That the agent believed there was probable cause to suspect Mark Carpellis clearly relevant, that the agent believed somebody else might be DPR, obviously highly relevant. And an alternative, she said, an alternate suspect strikes me as in the heartland of the defense, and the fact that Carpellis could be DPR has come out in spades. And when the prosecutor continued to, to argue with her, she said, look, this Carpellis thing, that cat's out of the bag. Court adjourned, everybody go home. And we went home for a long weekend, came back on Tuesday, and at that point, I felt like I walked through the looking glass and I was in a different reality. All of a sudden, all those beliefs and all those uh, testimony by the agent, mm, that's not so relevant now. And in fact, the jury needs to just forget they ever heard it. It's stricken from the record, and strict boundaries were set going forward and, and they carried through the rest of the trial. So questions like, did you suspect Mark Carpellis? That's off limits. Did you believe Mark Carpellis was DPR? 
Well, that's now off limits. Do you suspect that Mark Carpellis operated Silk Road? Off limits. And that Carpellis's lawyers offer to um, trade a name for their client? That's not relevant anymore. So that's day three. That's day four. What a, what a difference a weekend makes. And the reason the judge gave one of them, she said, well, this alternate suspect thing, that, that might confuse the jury. Yeah, we don't want to do that. And our, our Ross's lawyer said, my defense has been eviscerated. He said, can I have some time to regroup? No, can't have time to regroup. And as Forbes wrote, the defense was completely derailed. Because every time, and I'll show you in the future, these rules, these questions, and he was kept on such a tight leash, he couldn't effectively cross-examine. So basically, the government's argument was its own witness, Jared Duryagin, their agent, was unreliable, even in sworn affidavits, and that the defense couldn't use the sworn testimony of a federal agent from the government's own evidence. Yet later in the trial, they relied on testimony from a heroin addict who had had multiple offenses and um, was uh, testifying in exchange for a plea deal. And that was considered reliable. So basically, the cat was back in the bag and it stayed like that for the rest of the trial. Next, the um, defense's witnesses were blocked. They were not allowed to testify. There was a string of endless federal agents who came forward and um, basically bored everybody to death, but um, that, who testified about the laptop investigation, about um, you know, technical issues about that. And much of their testimony was uh, questionable, was considered questionable. Their protocol was called into question. Um, one of them, Christopher Beeson, testified that he had not followed the guidelines in <coughs> investigating the laptop. Um, and that um, the, uh, other things, like the laptop crashed in the middle of it. I mean, there's all kinds of things where they did not follow protocol. And I had a crypto security expert say to me that he's positive that they've planted things on that lamp, laptop because he said otherwise there's no reason to break protocol. In so many ways, they did. And what he told me was he said anything can be, did, can be planted. Digital forensics appears physical, but it isn't. It's much more vulnerable. You can make up data on a disk. A 10-year-old could do it. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, no, this is the other point. So we have this digital evidence that is um, unreliable, easily manipulated, easily planted. The government didn't produce a single live person, a single actual witness, to testify firsthand that Ross had authored anything attributed to the DPR. It was all digital and created and transmitted on an anonymous, untraceable network. Now, a, bank's, uh, a bank, a mortgage company, will not accept a bank statement in its form of a screenshot, because they know how easily faked it is. Um, and yet a court in the United States can send a man away from life based on the same kind of flimsy evidence. Um, I don't think people in this room need to be uh, told how, what a dangerous precedent that could be and how that could be misused. Um, then when the um, defense attempted to cross-examine these witnesses and drag out some information from these government agents. It was either curtailed or just denied. Um, and the judge even said, look, if you want information on this protocol, call your own witness. Which at that point, the defense called for a mistrial because that's putting the burden of proof on the defense. I mean, yeah, on the defendant, which is misplaced. And I'm like, does this woman even know the law? <laughs> But anyway, the defense did it anyway. Brought our own witness, computer expert Stephen Bellavin. He was uh, Columbia University. And he came in to challenge the government's testimony and, and show what holes it had in it. 
And he could have explained many technical issues, including um, the lack of security of open ports. Ross was on an open port downloading the Colbert report when he was arrested. How timestamps can be changed. The timestamps are very vulnerable to change. Um, and they use timestamps a lot in their, in their um, evidence. And why complex testimony behind hidden websites makes it almost impossible to prove anything. But he was blocked from testifying. And one of the reasons the judge gave, well, this case doesn't require special technical knowledge. She said that. It's in the transcript. <laughs> if this case doesn't require special technical knowledge, I don't know what does. Um, so then they brought in um, a Bitcoin expert, another government agent, who had worked on one other Bitcoin case before. The government paid Fifty-five thousand dollars for this testimony. It'd be nice to have that kind of money to defend Rosswood. And um, he gave his testimony, which also, according to experts, was flawed. It's what Roger Baer said about it. He said they don't understand it or they're intentionally lying. And so we need to challenge this. And so we brought our own witness, Andreas Antonopoulos, who volunteered pro bono to do it. And um, he's here he is testifying in Canada. He's a well-known Bitcoin expert, author, and um, he was blocked. One of the reasons that he couldn't come and explain the flaws in the testimony, well, the jury understands Bitcoin just fine. It's, it's irrelevant and unnecessary. Uh, only two of those jurors were under 40, and they said they didn't, had never heard of Bitcoin and now they're supposed to have understood something that complex just fine. So, by precluding the defense experts who would have countered the complex testimony of the government agents, uh, the appeal is saying that Ross was denied his Fifth and Sixth Amendment right to present a defense. We have that right. It was blocked. Another very important issue in the trial Fourth Amendment. Um, it's very foundational. It guards our privacy. It, it prevents and protects us from the government intruding in our homes, rummaging around, dragging us out. You know, it's uh, very important and it requires particularity. It's not, you can't just go, I'm going to search your whole house and see what I can find. I'm going to go on a fishing expedition. It requires you to say, I'm looking for this particular thing in this house. And if you want, if you happen to see something else that's interesting, you've got to go get another one. Um, in the appeal, the appeal states that that's the kind of warrant that they had for Ross's laptop and social media accounts was a general warrant, which is exactly that. It's rummaging around. And um, it's the kind of warrant that helped spark the American Revolution that's at the foundation of the Fourth Amendment. It's why they wrote it. And it um, is very important. The National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers has filed an amicus brief to support the appeal, saying that's right. This was a an illegal warrant, and Electronic Frontier Foundation joined them, agreeing, yes, they wrote a letter saying, yes, we agree with this amicus brief. What the government's saying, basically, is that because it's digital, it's not protected. It's not papers. Like it says, our founding fathers forgot to put digital information in that Fourth Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if they had seized a physical file cabinet, and done the same thing. It would be clearly unconstitutional. And yet, we all know a laptop, a phone, is like a file cabinet on steroids. It is a gateway to all kinds of private information. And they're saying, no, 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 it's not protected. It's not, it doesn't come under the Fourth Amendment. So this is a huge question for the digital age. Um, you know, just because it doesn't say, be secure in your computers, doesn't mean the principle isn't there. And um, it's, this is being argued in many uh, cases right now, including Ross's. And um, it will affect all of us, depending on the outcome of this. Um, so, and you know, whether we end up surrendering our right to privacy or not. Um, there was so much in this uh, appeal, but um, I really want to talk about the sentencing because it was so barbaric and so unconstitutional. 
and it's such a blatant um, example of government abuse of power. Um, one of the general principles in our law in sentencing is proportionality. You give a sentence that is proportional to the, the, the charge. And um, it's just a general principle. And to give a nonviolent person with no prior uh, offenses and no violent charges, double life without parole, plus four years, is so far beyond the norm and proportionality that it shocked the world. There were headlines all over the place like people couldn't believe it. It is being challenged in the appeal and then being supported by an amicus brief submitted by Drug Policy Alliance um, and, and supported by a former federal judge, Nancy Gertner, as well as lead law for enforcement against prohibition and just leadership USA. And they got together and said, this is, this is, uh, this sentence is uh, uh, draconian. This is not right. And basically um, inconsistent with contemporary standards of decency. It's indecent. Um, this is the, uh, the Sentencing Reform Act requires that a judge impose a sentence that is sufficient, but no longer than necessary, not greater than necessary. And, and this judge did not provide any reason why it was necessary to sentence Ross to life. They passed this, Congress passed this law to prevent this kind of over-sentencing, to prevent the kind of um, lack of proportionality and the um, disparities between other people who've committed crimes versus, you know, one person versus another. It should be relatively the same punishment. Um, that's what they created the law for. And yet there's this, what our, the appeal calls it such a grotesque disparity. And I'll just, I'll, I'll just uh, illustrate it for you. The biggest, the person convicted as being the biggest drug dealer on Silk Road, Jan Slomp, got 10 years. Ross was never uh, charged with actually selling anyone drugs. He was charged with creating and running a website that permitted it. Um, Stephen Sack, who was convicted as being the most successful heroin and cocaine dealer on Silk Road, got five years. Peter Nash, who was a top administrator, forum moderator, um, when the site had its highest sales volume, um, he got time served, 17 months. And, and um, the two agents, one got five years, one got six. Um, and then there's Ross. Convicted as being the creator and top admin of Silk Road, double life without parole. I would call that disproportional. And this is what really clicked for me because um, I'm like, why? You know, if they really care about drugs, it was really about drugs. I mean, she said in the sentencing, Ross is no better than a common drug dealer. And Cody Wilson says, well, then why don't you charge him as one? Yeah, yeah. Well, they made it really clear why. They consider Ross dangerous politically. The, the prosecution said, you are the first to do this, and basically we cannot allow this. Having a marketplace, having this situation going on anonymously, out of our control. Derek described it very well earlier. And um, we can't have it. You're the first one, so you're, you're going to be an example. And I guess if you're the fourth one, you don't serve life. You, it's a diminishing return. The first one has to be the example. It's like putting a spike on a, I mean, a head on a spike in the Middle Ages. You do that, that's what's going to happen to you. Um, and they made it political in the trial. They would not allow Ross's libertarian views to be spoken of, referenced, or known to the jury at all. They were, they were banished from the trial that he was a libertarian as was the, the fact that there were legal things sold on the site. It was, it was a very controlled narrative, and um, that wasn't part of it. And in the sentencing, the judge specifically referenced the libertarian philosophy of the Silk Road and DPR's writings that, uh, in one quote she made, was uh, that DPR said the government was the enemy. And she said she found this deeply troubling and very dangerous. 
I don't really think it would take me that long to go around this conference and find somebody who would say, yeah, the government's the enemy. We're allowed to say, yeah, hey, this room. We're allowed to say that. Political speech is sacrosanct. She's supposed to be defending the First Amendment. And uh, yet she used that, um, his, those political quotes as a way to justify this draconian sentence. And uh, I find that, to quote her, deeply troubling and very dangerous. What it's really about is a 26-year-old, very idealistic, wanting people to experience a free market, uh, open, anonymous free market, and it threatened the government. It was the platform that he's being put away for, not the product. And you can argue that he was naive or arrogant or it was, you know, all these things, yeah. But double life without parole? For basically starting a website. It's for a platform. It wasn't because of what they've proven by their sentences. That's not what they care about. I was uh, honored to be brought to Eastern Europe uh, last fall to speak uh, in Prague and, and, and then in Poland, and we visited Auschwitz. I'm, here I am in Auschwitz. Very sobering experience to see that. And uh, I overheard a, a tour guide saying, um, the lesson here is watch your politicians because this didn't happen that long ago. Auschwitz really breaks home that this can happen and these kinds of erosions of our freedom and our protection is how it happens. And I really believe we're at a crossroads in history now. Because we're transitioning from the digital, uh, from the 20th century into the digital age. And we're kind of in uncharted waters legally. There's all kinds of things going on in the courts that are being determined now, with precedent, including this case, that will um, impact all of us in the future. And um, it's a very volatile and kind of um, fluid time, legally. And um, will the trend be towards privacy and individual freedom, or is it going to be toward government control and intrusion? That's really the big question in all these different ways. Um, a lot of people ask me who is Ross, you know. Uh, I mean, the way he's portrayed in the media is so not him. Ross is a peaceful, um, very principled libertarian. I know you'd like him. He's very likable. He's very cares about people. He's one of you, really. Here's his signature on the Students for Liberty commemorative T-shirt that's hanging in their Washington D.C. office. He's one of the first members. He was actually nominated this year as Alumnus of the Year. Nice. Um, <laughs> uh, here he is with uh, Ron Paul. That's Penn State. He's on the lower, kneeling on the lower left, Ron Paul's in the middle standing. He's a libertarian, he has uh, those ideals. And he needs your help, he needs help. I need help to help him. Uh, as the appeal demonstrates, as the trial demonstrates, there's some big issues and I, leave it there. I don't have time to, to, to cover them all. We have a website, freeross.org, goes into quite a bit of detail about all the different things, the case. And I really recommend you go there. But we can't, no one can fight the government alone unless they have multi, multi millions of dollars. We can't, we don't. And uh, they're too rich, they're very rich and very powerful. And we've gotten a lot of help, but we really need help. I mean, it, the, the bills are unbelievable, not just for lawyers, but other expenses. It costs. 13, over $13,000 to bind up the appeal into book form and digital form to give to the appellate judges. I'm like, what are these book covers made of? $13,000 more. Um, so if you care about free trials, if you think the drug war is out of control and really about government expansion has to be stopped, I just ask you to please do what you can. I mean, obviously we need donations, oh, we need ideas, we need energy. Um, there's lots of things on there, ways to help on our website. And um, please share our Facebook posts, retweet us. You know, all of this builds into um, a grassroots movement that um, that's what really needs to happen in many of these cases and in Ross's for sure. So anyway, thanks for listening. Oh, wait.
here's Ross. I forgot to go to the last slide. Um, here he is in prison in 2013. Yeah. Could you let everyone know how to write him in your own website? Yeah, that's on the website on the contact us page. Yeah, he'd love to do that. Yeah. So, thank you. yeah, thanks. Thank you. Any questions? Any other questions or anything? Harvey Spirits. Uh, Ross is a, a, just an exceptionally positive person. And um, he's intentionally positive. And he, um, he's trying to be a good influence. He's teaching classes, GED classes. There were a um, hundred letters submitted. Uh, to the judge, begging her for the minimum sentence. She gave him way over that. It was 20 years of minimum, mandatory minimum. And uh, four of them were fellow inmates. I've had a guard come to me and gush about how great Ross is. I mean, he's he's really trying to be positive. Sometimes it's very, very hard. It's tough. It's boring. It's tedious. It's, you know, he loves nature. He can't be out in nature. He, you know, it's not a beautiful place, you know. But he's making it He's handling it as well as possible. Tatiana, you talked to him, visited him, and you know he is, right? And he's just so inspiring. Yeah, it's like he's literally the most positive person I've ever met. And I hate those people that tell you, be positive, and they're just, you know, rich and stuff. I mean, if, if he can be positive, I've gotten a lot out of just, I don't know, seeing that exemplified, which you don't really see. I mean, he has literally the most miserable life ahead of him, potentially. And he can maintain optimism, and I think that that's maybe something that he takes strength from as well in terms of like being a good example. Um, but you know, whenever I go there, he's always really thoughtful. He's really kind. He's like asks what's going on. He doesn't get mad about anything. I was telling Lynn that you know I love cookies and stuff, right? So one day I was like, "Oh, can I get you some Doritos?" He's like, "Oh, I wouldn't eat those." I'm like, "What the hell is going on?" Because I would eat them. And then so you know, I mean, he's even working on you know staying in shape. He's working out every day. He's um, been writing a lot. Um, and I don't know. Did you mention the art project? So Ross is really. Oh yeah, it's on the website. Um, he's a really gifted artist, and he draws. So he did this thing where um, he drew a picture of the trial I saw. It's literally in pencil, like a prison drawing of uh, you know, his interpretation of how he saw the courtroom and everything. And he dreamt up the idea of if people donate even a dollar, that it reveals a little pixel of the picture. So it's almost all revealed. There's still you know, some more um, you know, things to be revealed or whatever. But basically, um, it was a way to kind of use creativity and activism that I think is really cool. So I hope you'll yeah, be able to do more. Can you say that website again? Sure. Um, free Ross. Dot org. I guess I should put it up in my support PowerPoint sheet. <laughs> yeah. At the bottom of oh, every slide. Every slide. Um, I, I want to make the point he's intentionally positive. He says he makes it a point. He says he hates to wake up in the morning. He's like, oh, God, another, you know, oh, here I am, you know. Then he's like, I'm going to be, I'm going to set my mind right. And he's inspired me to. I'm like, well, if Ross, what am I complaining about the weather for? If Ross doesn't get to be in weather. Yeah. He'd love to be in any weather. He yeah, gets, it really makes you think. Well, he only gets an hour and a half every three days, but then they're like, oh, the roof is closed, yeah, or oh, we're bored. Like, they literally don't let him outside for two weeks, three weeks at a time. I mean, it's really, really inhumane. Um, it's gotten better. But on the other yeah. side, you know, when he was, like, teaching the guys in the in the jail, uh, the GED, I was like, oh, well, how's that going? He's like, oh, they're not that motivated. And I said to him, like, Russell, why are you trying to motivate them? He's like, no, these are grown ass men. He's like, they need to motivate themselves. And he and then he went on to say that, you know, that kind of attitude has actually been really helpful to the people there because they learn a longer term lesson. And this is kind of his mindset. I don't, you know, I don't think I could do that if I was there. Or another thing, you know, we were just kind of playing around and asking questions. And he's like, oh, well, last question, what kind of thing are you going to do for someone today? I'm like, oh, I don't know. You know call my grandma, which I call every day, it's not that great, but I didn't have a thing. And so the guard calls him away, and, and the guard says, oh, you know, you got your cookies there. And I'm like, well, what about you, Ross? And he comes back, gives his cookies to some kid, and he's walking away. He's like, yeah, I don't know, I'll have to think about it. And I'm like, you just did something nice, you know what I mean? Well, I would have preferred if I got the cookies, but that's the same. <laughs> but I mean, this is, this is what I find so remarkable about him, is it's not that affected 
Fia's kind of, oh, my piece of love. He's genuinely <laughs> kind and genuinely thoughtful and doesn't expect some sort of accolades for it. And, and I think that that's a really unique quality. So, yeah, he's definitely not someone who needs to be locked in a cage for life. He's not a threat to anyone. Yeah, like, it's so as, 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 as he's like spoken yeah. about, like, like other, to other inmates that are like in there for like nonviolent, like for bogus crime. Mm -hmm. bogus. So, yeah, well, yeah, that kind of, you know, the yeah, basic bogus reasons. I mean, not I assume, for sure. Not necessarily preaching, but at least kind of, well, like, you know. Well, he, what these inmates have said, it's really helped them to get through this day, oh, okay. I think his attitude. But he also told me that um, he thinks that only about 10% of the people that are in there belong in there. Everybody wow. else is just crimes. And then the worst thing is, is it's not, you know, Ross is really lucky because he has Lynn going around, everybody thinks he's great. But, you know, there's all these poor slobs in there. I met this woman, she had, a, she had children, and, you know, she's like, yeah, before my husband went in, my children were all getting A's. And now they're all getting D's and F's, Aww. and and it's like, how are you supposed to prevent that ripple effect? Yeah. It's not just the people in the prison; it's all these kids that are going to end Sorry. up. What are they going to get past the end of society? Two and a half million children in this country have an incarcerated wow. parent. Wow! I know we got to go to lunch, uh, but it's you go on and on about mass incarceration and the price. And these are not most prisoners now are nonviolent drug offenders. Right. It's 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 a disgrace. The United is, States has more than any country, more prisoners. <coughs> is he allowed to receive books? Yeah, but it has to be directly from a publisher. From a publisher? Or you can write <laughs> cat publishing, I don't know. <laughs> or we, we could have it sent. <laughs> yeah, great <laughs> books could definitely send. Yeah, okay. yeah, that'd be cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you thank for you. listening. Really appreciate it. Yeah.